Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chris. It's fantastic to be here. Yeah, like I just, we were just chatting. I've spent the last 24 hours uh, on STR University and learning a lot about you. So I'm, I'm really pumped uh, for today. You, you've built something remarkable. Let's start with kind of your career, uh, how it kind of started, and then kind of how you made your way into investing and, and developing uh, short term rentals. Sure. And I'll give you a little bit um, more than perhaps you've asked, but I think it's all relevant. So when I graduated Cornell University in 1991, I took, a, I guess it's called a gap year, but between my first job, I moved to Crested Butte, Colorado. I was basically a ski bum waiting tables in the evening um, and really just wanted to get that like 100 days of skiing in under my belt before I face this like career and life journey. But I was always valuing lifestyle and quality of life and experiences. So in 1991, I did that. I turned down jobs that I was recruited for and said, you know what, I'm going to put all that on pause. It'll all be there when I'm done. And so my girlfriend and I moved to Crested Butte, Colorado and um, waited tables and skied 100 days. Don't regret it for a second. If anybody's listening and you're facing life decisions like this, like it's in this inspiration and creativity that we perform our best. And so that's where I started. Um, I went to Chicago. My uh, girlfriend at the time, who became my wife and is now my ex-wife, was in medical school in Chicago. And um, I had a couple of good buddies from Cornell that were trading at the Mercantile Exchange and the Board of Trade. And so I started clerking at the Mercantile Exchange, which for those of you who don't know, is like the most, I mean, there's the runner level and then there's the clerk. So I <laughs> managed to skip the runner, um, but I started as a clerk. And that basically meant that these really um, intense, intelligent, people in the pits that are doing all the hand signals and flashing stuff where the math must be right, 100% accurate. You must stay calm during like periods of dislocation because that's when they need you most. Um, we're training me, yelling at me, abusing me, forcing me to do stuff. But it was really a position where um, I learned an awful lot and I caught my boss's attention early. Uh, within a matter of 30 days, he promoted me to trading some of his risk capital. Mm. And I was like, dude, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> this is your money. But if you think that I've got something that you've identified, like, let's run with it. And so I was the youngest person promoted to a trader. It wasn't a ton of money. And I was doing a relatively um, straightforward uh, arbitrage where you buy in one market cheap and you sell in the other market expensive or vice versa, sell expensive and then buy cheap. And the reason this is important is because I view myself very much as an investor. I view myself as a trader. Um, and what that means is that I will buy or sell any asset at any point in time. Even if I'm bullish on something, there's a price I'll sell it. And even if I'm negative on something, there's a price that I'll buy it. And so it really honed my mind into sort of value. What's fair value? And the bid ask spread is what traders use, right? Like I'll buy it at 100, I'll sell it at 102. And that exists in real estate, that exists in stocks, that exists in crypto. It doesn't really matter, but that skill set is what um, I learned. Long story short, I didn't really love the environment. I'm not a very physical, like masculine battler pushing people in the pits. And so I thought I'd go get some more education. And I went to uh, the Wharton School for my MBA. I got an MBA in finance and I graduated in 1998, which is like the exact worst time to graduate from business school. But I was very fortunate and I was recruited by the Blackstone Group. Uh, they had a very small emerging division. It was called Blackstone Alternative Asset Management. And basically, uh, I was the only person hired. Um, they picked me. They saw my resume. They liked my trading background. I don't know what else they liked, but they saw something. And so they invited me to interview. And I accepted the job. I mean, it's a huge feather in my cap. And the Blackstone Group is, was at the time and remains today one of the preeminent institutions. And so I was just like, okay, this is fantastic. Um, my mission when I joined them uh, was Pete Peterson and Steve Schwartzman, the founder, said, here's $1.1 billion of our money. And this is a 1998 dollars, so it's even more today. And they said, simple, we want you to make equity-like returns with bond-like volatility and under no circumstances, don't lose any money. <laughs> and so like, that's the holy grail, right? Like we want really outsized double digit type returns. We want minimal or no volatility and don't lose any money. And here's a billion one and you guys go do that. So um, what we basically did was we invested globally all around the world. The only way to accomplish that mission, uh, which is 
virtually impossible, by the way, is to find mispriced assets um, and then create or unlock the value, help other people see that value and realize that. And in simple terms, we're creating alpha, right? So we're taking as much beta as the market will give us. And then on top of that, we're adding a layer of alpha and that's the value extraction. And that's the, the real stuff that any investor should be looking for is the value add, the alpha. So I did that for a period of time. That's now gone on to be the single largest uh, alternative asset platform on the planet. I think they have over $80 billion today. Since 1998 until today, they've grown that to $80 billion, which is just insane. I was recruited away from them for another firm called Remius Capital Group. And it was a similar story. The principals there were uh, Peter Cohen, ex-chairman and CEO of Shearson Lehman Brothers. So if any of your audience are you know, my age or older, that name will have a lot of significance. Uh, and my direct report, my boss was Tom Strauss, who was ex-president of Solomon Brothers. Uh, and they came and said, we have $110 million of our own capital. We wanna do similar investing type strategy. Will you help us grow this business? Uh, and so I joined them in uh, 2000. And from 2000 until I was actually laid off in 2009, we grew that business from 110 million to four and a half billion dollars under management. I was the fourth person hired. And by the time I left, we had about 55 people. Uh, and ultimately, I was co-head of investments of that group, uh, finding value all over the planet and creating diversified portfolios to extract alpha. Yep. All right. Two things I want to take from that. The first is when you're looking for, when you're just given money and told, and in both circumstances, it, it seems like you were in a position was like, go find value. There's like billions of things on the planet that have value in them. Do you have like a filter for how you start with what you're going to look for? Um, and then kind of go like, you know, big filter up front, narrow it down. How do you find that? Because it seems like there could be a lot of opportunities. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the answer is, and just to be uh, very clear, we were investing in world-class hedge fund managers. So they were actually executing the underlying strategies, but we were picking talent and also strategies and geographies and so on. So I invested with uh, some really incredible people and got to know them personally, like a uh, Bill Ackman and um, Carl Icahn and uh, legends. I mean, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. I mean, just my learning was remarkable. So the, the challenge that we would have was to be forward looking. Um, and what we would try and do, and this is the way that we created the portfolios. This is the way I invest in short term rentals. And this all comes together is we take a forward look of the world and we start with a top down approach. So I don't care necessarily at this point how much value is in an individual asset or an individual strategy. I want to be in the right strategies for the future and the future runway so that I'm in the right place. And the concept is the rising tide lifts all boats. So I'm a huge fan of everything that you've done in the industrial sector, right? But a significant portion of that is being in industrial at the right time. Right. So if you make that forward looking decision and say, hey, and I don't know enough about industrial to speak about it intelligently, but my guess is there's a lot to do with e-commerce and last mile and fulfillment and proximity and same day delivery. And like those are the kind of things that perhaps you and everyone at Fort was sitting around and saying, we think this is going to become more important going forward. And so we want to lock up these locations closest to met major metro areas, for example. Right. And so it's that forward top down look where we start. Where do we want to be equally important? What do we want to avoid? Like, I don't care how attractive that asset is, but I don't want that exposure. And then once we have our exposures dialed in and we would literally sit down quarterly and say, what's our forward view on U.S. equities, international equities, bonds, commodities, real estate, private equity. And we would forecast now it's imperfect, but we would at least attempt we would forecast two things, the returns that we would anticipate for each of these asset classes and also the volatility. And then once we had that down, it sort of gave us like a map. OK, well, this is sort of what we're looking for for the next call it three year period or five year period. Here's what we want to underway. And then that with that map in hand, we would go find the best allocations that we could possibly make 
to express that view from a bottom-up perspective. I love it. Well, with, with, with forward thinking in mind, and, and that's how we're going to lead into the STR discussion, but before that, I would be doing the audience a disservice to not ask you the question of, you had to be forward thinking in something that you did. And in one of your positions, you fired Madoff just in time for your LPs. That was a forward looking thing. I would be doing everybody a disservice to not at least say what happened there and how did it happen? That's, that's just, you know, interesting. Yeah. I mean, um, and I just got like goosebumps because I mean, I literally helped so many people, so many of our investors save so much money. And, um, I was uh, bold and cocky and maybe didn't know better or maybe knew exactly right. But um, when I joined that second group at Ramius Capital, uh, my boss, Tom Strauss, was very good friends with Bernie Madoff. And he had him in the portfolio with his own money and his LP's money. And so my first job when I came over was to take a look at the existing portfolio, analyze it, understand what was in there, um, and go meet with all of the individual managers and make sure that it expressed our forward view of uh, the world. And um, I have a very strong opinion and very strong conviction about many things, including short-term rentals, but I'm also self-aware enough to know that I have blind spots and there are other things that um, other people have superior intellect and knowledge about. So I always have checks and balances. I had a legal team that could stop me out, kill any position or fire any manager. I had a risk management team that could also stop me out. So even though I'm co-head of investments, I have checks and balances along the way. So that it's not like one guy gone rogue and like the hell with it, right? We're creating an institutional portfolio. So with that end, we decided to go through all of the different positions that were in the portfolio and meet with all the managers and make sure that they checked all the boxes from all of the different criteria. And um, Madoff, I had heard of, we had done some work on him in, at Blackstone. Uh, we didn't get comfortable with him. So it was sort of like a yellow flag. And now I'm managing a portfolio where he's in there and has a large allocation. And ultimately, um, I kept asking my boss, who's you know worth a lot more money than me and a lot more experience and a lot more seasoned, explain this to me. And he couldn't. And explain this to me. And he couldn't. And how does it work in this environment? And he couldn't. I said, Tom, you know, with all due respect, why don't we just go see Bernie and we'll ask these questions directly. And he said, oh, well, you know, Bernie doesn't really take meetings anymore. He's closed. He doesn't need any more money. So he's not doing that. And I said, well, Tom, you know, we need to get answers to this. There's no way I'm putting my name and our investors capital into a strategy that I don't have a thorough understanding about. And so we kept pushing and pushing. And uh, in the end, he contacted Bernie to see if he would take the meeting and he turned it down. And he said, so let's just pass on this and we'll come back to it later. And I literally said, Tom, you know, with all due respect, either Bernie goes or I go, but I'm not running this portfolio, managing money for people that I don't understand the risks. I don't understand the investment strategy. You're asking me to do something impossible. And to Tom's credit, you know, here I am a young MBA. I worked at the Blackstone Group for a couple of years. He literally fired his friend to keep me on and run the business. And when we made that decision and we put in the termination notice, because not that I knew that it was a fraud, I had enough questions. I suspected that there was something amiss. Um, there was enough like, you know, low volatility and positive consistent returns always, which was not explained by the investment strategy. So I had basis for this. It wasn't just like, hey, if this guy won't meet with me, I'm out. Um, but to his credit, he listened to me. We put in the termination notice. And if you follow the entire case, there was a seven year clawback period where people who had exited had to return all of their gains and the investment back into the collective pool to be distributed to LPs. And we literally just beat that seven year clawback. So our investors were spared all of the gains, all of the investment, everything. They sailed off into the sunset. So you identified that in like 2001, 2002, and he didn't get caught until 2008, 2009. Exactly. Man, I, I we could do a whole podcast on just what you uncovered and went through. I won't I won't do that, but man, that is fascinating. What what I would share with the audience because, you know, it's a call and I could have made a different call, but you have to do the right things for the right reason even if it involves some self-sacrifice, right? Like literally I was prepared to walk away from this dream job because I just you know, my my mission is to preserve people's capital and grow it. 
And I can't have like an unknown, like a question mark. It doesn't matter if it's a 1% position or a 3% position. That's not what people were charging us to do. And so I felt strongly. And like I said, I give Tom uh, tremendous credit. He lived uh, in Bernie's building. He was a member of multiple country clubs. And here he had to go say, well, this young buck doesn't really like it. So, you know, we're going to do it. So I think he made the more difficult call. Mine was pretty straightforward. Well, a lot of people will we'll in this little segment on a lot of people on here raise money or are LPs. Um, maybe let's just end it with like, what are some things that that immediately sent up an antenna that whether it's Bernie Madoff or somebody raising a million dollars for a real estate deal would set you off immediately if you if you saw it happen again? So the first thing is um, the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it may well be too good to be true and you need to spend some more time and you need to get very comfortable with all of the different uh, implications, assumptions, uh, the answers. And you know the, the challenge, especially in these fraud type situations is they're generally very likable, they're highly regarded, they're held in high esteem. And so you want to not rock the boat, right? Like you want access to this fund. And that's how he was able to defraud so many people. So I would say, keep asking questions, dig down until you're comfortable. And if you're uncomfortable for any reason, you know, like pass, miss it. The other thing is um, understanding sort of the chain of communications. Like um, in this particular case, his broker dealer was where he was transacting a lot of this stuff, which wasn't regulated to the same degree as his major entities and so on. And so there was not potential for conflict, but there was a lot of uncertainty about what was actually happening. And that's what created that you know opportunity for the fraud. Um, and so just if you see something that's a yellow flag or a red flag or gives you pause, Listen to your gut. It's probably right. Yep. All right. Now the now the the fun stuff. Here we go. Um, we just got done talking about you got to be able to see the themes of the future and find a way to invest in it today. Um, you could have put money and done really anything with your career, and you chose um, this asset class that's emerging, STRs. Let's just talk about why this, what happened that brought you here, um, because you've devoted your life to it at this point. Yeah. um, So like anything, uh, I I didn't have high certainty and high conviction. The high certainty and high conviction uh, grows over time as we learn more and have, have more relationships and more visibility and stronger views. So where I sit today is very different than where I sat seven years ago when I started investing in the space. I've always been a a real estate investor and holder, and I believe it's one of the best ways to generate, um, you know, real wealth between the price appreciation, the income potential, the depreciation, all of these things that your audience knows so well about, but that exists in the short-term rental space too. And from where I sat from the investor vantage point and the finance uh, background, oftentimes uh, what we would find is mispriced risk. And that's what I see today in the short-term rental space. We'll circle back to that, but that's the entire investment thesis is that vacancy risk is mispriced. It's kind of like auto insurance and that's why the auto insurance companies do really well and so on, but the risk is mispriced. The other thing that I would say from a financial perspective is oftentimes there's new entrants into an existing business that either provide more liquidity So they tranche it up or they give more flexibility or you can like find this one segment of the capital stack that you want to invest in. And so the financial engineering uh, is what we're seeing here in the short-term rental space. Inherently, there's nothing different about a short-term rental versus a long-term rental except for the duration, right? Like there's a lot of people that like a 12-month lease and there's a lot of landlords that like a 12-month lease, but that's not set in stone and that's not like the end-all be-all. What if you wanted an 11 month lease or an 11 day lease or, you know, a one day stay? So what we're doing here in many ways is taking something that we know that works and providing liquidity into the market by tranching it up and cutting it down. And people like myself from an investor perspective say, okay, well, even if there's risk, like every other day is vacant, as long as I'm charging more than 2x on the filled days, this may work superior. And that's what we're finding. We're currently making between two and three X what a long-term lease would make in the short-term rental space. I think that premium is too wide. It will um, narrow as more institutions come into the space. 
But to put it in perspective, Chris, if you have a 12 month lease that uh, you sign out for $1,000 a month, 12,000 a year, we see people routinely in my YouTube channel, in my Facebook group, um, that are making two to three times that. So that would be 2,000 a month or 3,000 a month. There's no CapEx. And yes, it's a little bit more operationally intensive, but not two or three X, right? So it's mispriced in the market even today. And that's what you mean by vacancy risk is mispriced, is that people are willing to rent units for much cheaper so that they don't have days that go vacant, when in reality, they should be thinking, don't think about it that way. You could make two or three times if you're willing to chop this up into smaller uh, obligations. Right. And it's not only people thinking that way. People think that way because uh, the system, if you will, encourages them to think that way. So financing is a major component in all uh, real estate asset classes, and it's much easier and less expensive to get financing for, say, a 12-month lease. You show up at a bank or a lender and you say, look, here's my sort of guaranteed cash flow stream. They can underwrite it. You show up to that same bank and you're like, hey, you know, I have no idea if vacancy risk is, you know, 40% vacancy, 60% vacancy, 90% vacancy. The banks and the underlying institutions don't know what to do with that either. Um, that's all changing. As the asset class is maturing, there are now very forward-thinking lenders who will say, show me your existing Airbnb report, show me your Verbo report, I'll underwrite that cash flow. And some even will underwrite it based on projections from a service called AirDNA, which is basically a big data aggregator. They take a look at all of the different you know, homes on that block and in that zip code, and they project a 3-2 will generate this. And some of these forward lenders today will underwrite that cash flow. They obviously haircut it and make sure you have enough DSCR. But what's interesting, Chris, and this is like the th kind of stuff that I anticipate is going to continue at an accelerating pace. What the lenders are finding is that these are some of their best loans. And because if you think about it, if we're making two to three X, they have less risk, not more. And they charge a premium. So I'm getting 30 year financing on single family homes. 30 year fixed financing sub 5% between 4.5 and 4.75 today, um, which is incredible. When I started this five years ago, I had to go apply for a second vacation home and a third vacation home. And eventually my private bank said, Hey, Richard, you know, you can't have this many vacation homes. What's going on here? So now we're starting to get commercial type lenders using DSCR coverage ratios. And they love these loans because, in fact, they find that they're superior, not inferior. I don't I'm not brown nosing when I say I've done 195 of these. And it's very often uh, it's not very often that my mind kind of explodes, um, especially when it comes to things we're talking about real estate. But that kind of just uh, rocked my world. You, you are so <laughs> right. And it is very mispriced. Where are these lenders and these uh, capital providers? Because if I was in Fort Worth, Texas, I, you know, no offense to my Fort Worth bankers, but I would probably walk in with this discussion and they would look at me like, you're crazy. How are you seeking these people out? And how quickly is this narrative changing from where it was, say, two years ago, pre-COVID? Yeah, so um, there's institutions like I use Host Financial. If anybody contacts Host Financial, tell them I sent you. Hopefully you get, you know, preferred they're, they're busy as can be, I'll tell you now, right? Like the few people that are doing this, uh, and he's a mortgage broker, my friend Adam, um, they have more demand than they can possibly fulfill. So to the extent that you drop my name or Richard, uh, short-term rental university, maybe it gets you better uh, service. Um, but there's more and more people, there's banks out there that are doing it directly. Uh, these banks are backed by big money behind them and they love the space and the narrative is changing radically in the last couple of years. And I think it's going to continue to accelerate. There's more and more entrance, uh, new groups, new divisions are being formed. But this concept of like short term rentals being inaccessible or not scalable or all of the sort of reasons that people have shied away from it beyond like just buying a vacation house, that's all baloney. Like literally, you, you should not believe any of that because it's changing rapidly. Um, I just had a conversation with some hotel guy on Twitter. Um, and uh, <laughs> for those of you who follow him, incredibly nice guy, incredibly knowledgeable. I mean, 
you talk about mind blown terms of experience and you guys should all go follow him. But the conversations that he's been around with institutions that are looking, bidding, circling, I mean, there's just zero doubt, right? Like where we sit today, there's zero doubt that this landscape is going to change um, significantly in the next few years. Now, that doesn't mean that the opportunity doesn't exist. The goal for me and Stomp Capital is where I'm a GP and I raise LP money. Um, the goal for us is to have the assets and the size and the scale that attracts those same institutions. Because as you know, Chris, size does matter. Right, like I could have the best asset in the world, but like if it generates even ninety-eight percent return, it may not move the needle for like a Blackstone Group or a Starwood or something like that. So you have to have a, a portfolio of meaningful size with key locations that have much more value and importance going forward than they do today, and that's the kind of thing that we dangle in front of them. And I'm perfectly happy running and owning and operating these uh, cash flow engines because we're getting paid handsomely to hold them and operate them. But if somebody makes me an irresistible offer, we're kind of building that portfolio. Like we're seeking that irresistible offer. Yep. Oh man, I'm pumped for this conversation. All right. Before <laughs> we get into like locations and everything else, there's a few things you've said. Who... I think when I think of STR, and a lot of people do, they think about the person that's going on a vacation. And certainly there is that. But describe to me the type of customers, maybe categorize them that that are renting these. Are these people that just want to live in four different spots throughout the year? I mean, how do you think about the customer for these products? And then we'll get into what you're building to serve said audience. Cool. So- it's a spectrum, um, and and it's also a spectrum from a hosting perspective. So let's just start with that. I'm a huge advocate, and I believe you, Chris, and I believe every one of your audience members should go own a lifestyle asset and short-term rent it and have it pay for itself and maybe even get paid to own that and spend two weeks there with your family. So like when I look forward, I think that exists for everybody. You no longer have to be a multimillionaire to have a vacation house by the lake and go and enjoy it. And so I think everybody should have that portion of it. That's a very different uh, investment strategy and the return hurdles have much less to do with sort of rate of return as, a, as it has like rate of quality of life. So let's put that aside. We're gonna spend time speaking about the investable asset class as opposed to like the lifestyle asset class. From the investment perspective, we're seeing more and more people, and Brian Chesky was just on uh, the news announcing this as well. We're seeing more and more people stay for longer periods of time, travel more frequently. And what's happened as a result of COVID, and to be clear, COVID is not the cause of this. COVID is the accelerant of the trends that we already saw in place. We've accelerated literally a decade. The conversation that we're having, remote working, work from anywhere, that was all starting to happen. But now everybody knows it can happen. And what I mean by everybody knows, there's judges that are hearing cases remotely. There's telehealth that's happening remotely. So even things that we said, oh, yeah, it's fine if you're a creative, you can do that. But you can't do it if you're this. Because of COVID, we disprove that. Almost everything can happen, you know, with the exception of like, if you're a plumber and you have to go physically into a building, yeah, that's not going to happen remotely. But for vast, major quantities of people, they can do this stuff remotely. And what we're starting to see is that people are traveling differently, living differently, vacationing differently, and everything is being rewritten. So you have to think about those future implications and how people live, work, play. And so what we're starting to see, and this is remarkable, is people are traveling for work and now tacking on a vacation, as opposed to I'm going on vacation and then I'll work a few days. So people are saying, listen, I, I, we just literally right before this inquiry, we got somebody requesting Edge Camp Sporting Club, which is our 14,000, I'm sorry, 14 bedroom, 12,000 square foot place. And they said, could we come for the month of February and the month of March? They're going to be working. It's off season. It's not like, you know, the surf isn't good. It's cold, but they want to go work in an inspired place, look at incredible natural beauty be in a different environment, and that's work. It's not vacation and it's not play. Okay. If you had to say 
that we were doing this from 10 years from now, we're, we're going to do part two 10 years from now. Hit me with a couple, th- like continue on this thread. What are okay. things like you've painted the picture of where we're headed. And so we could all agree. Yes. Remote this, you know, people are traveling differently, but like, give me something that maybe we haven't even thought about yet that you're in your head is already there. Yeah. So one of the major themes um, that I've been teaching on the YouTube channel and that we're investing in and we're actually creating uh, is community. I think community becomes ever more important uh, as as human people seeking relationships. Now we're spending more and more time uh, on the internet and Zoom, and then we go into the metaverse and Web 3.0. Like we're becoming less and less connected as as human uh, species. And so I think that when we do gather around lodging, vacation, work, and so on, the sense of community becomes ever more important. And so consequently, when we're designing purpose-built short-term rentals, everything is around the sense of community. It's not taking an existing single family home and retrofitting it and just tranching it up and saying, we'll do monthly rentals. Like that's good. There's a lot of opportunity for that. But the way that you would live in a purpose-built short-term rental is very different than the way that you would live for 30 years in the exact same home. And so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in our in our short-term rentals that we're purpose building, we have four different living rooms in individual homes. And the reason is because we anticipate little breakout sessions, little one-on-ones. Somebody might want to do a podcast on the second floor and not disturb the people on the third or fourth floor. And that's not a home office, right? It's kind of like this environment where it's maybe kind of interesting for a podcast, um, but it allows people to have these little breakout sessions, not in the one common living room and not in their bedroom. Um, the other thing that we're doing is, and, and by way of example, if you had a farm location and you were farming all of your vegetables and you're doing farm to table, you might have a way bigger kitchen and open floor plan and have that be the hub for your sort of like farm to table experience. Conversely, if you had it in an urban area and the reason that your location is valuable is because you can walk to all these great restaurants, you might have a much smaller kitchen. You might have like a micro kitchen. But yet when you design a single family home, whether it's in Fort Worth or in New York City or anything, the floor plans and and the user experience is largely the same. And yet for short term rentals, that's antiquated. And that's what you mean by purpose built. Every uh, property that you're approaching, you are thinking about how the customer is going to interact and you're getting rid of the old single family house rules that you need a living room and a kitchen and a dining room and some bedrooms and saying, let's throw that out the window and, and start with the experience. Correct. And also every bedroom is en suite. So like it feels like a hotel. It feels like you're somewhere special. It doesn't feel like you're in Mr. and Mrs. Jones house and like they vacated, right? Um, So we're designing this experience. And the reason that we're designing this experience is because it really gets people lit up, excited, inspired, motivated. We had some incredible guests. You asked about the demographics. Um, We had some... All of our guests are are remarkable and forward thinking and successful. We definitely appeal to um, outdoor enthusiasts that are affluent or super affluent. And the reason that we do that is because we're providing for them the ability to access their passion and price isn't what they're optimizing for, right? So like we all know people that love skiing, like myself included, I'll spend whatever it costs to go heli skiing, catch the right line on the right day, the powder. There's people that are equally avid about surfing or yoga or, you know, art, music. Um, If you can create experiences in world-class locations to enable these passionate, affluent people to do what lights them up, you have pricing power, you have no competition, and your margins are insane. Oh, so so I'm sorry. Let me let me go back to the so the the, the person that I was referencing, uh, they they were kite boarding past the Outer Banks. They saw this property going up. Uh, this is now two years ago. They stayed last year, um, and they stopped in and said, "What is this? Is this a multifamily building? Is this a hotel? Is this condos? I want to know more." And we said, "No, we're building you know a short term rental, and this is going to be available for you to rent for five nights or seven nights." And he said, "Look, I'm turning sixty. 
this is my dream. I'm coming down here with uh, 13 other friends of mine. We're going to have an entire period of time um, just together, off-site, kiting all day long. This is going to be remarkable. My girlfriend, uh, Erica, is our director of hospitality. She's incredibly talented at this. So he said, what's the price? And we weren't even open. We were still under construction. So I picked what I thought was an outlandish price, and it cleared. So that became like my low price, and we've gone up <laughs> since then significantly. Um, but he, char he paid about $40,000 for the lodging, uh, I think for five or six nights. And um, we thought that that was remarkable. He subsequently spent about $120,000 on these bespoke activities that we offer a la carte. So we don't have any of these uh, the costs associated with the labor. We have third-party freelance vendors that this is what they do. But he had catered meals every single day. He had servers. We had two masseuse on staff. Um, we had live music. We had fire dancers. We had a beach dinner. All of this stuff. So he spent 3x the cost of lodging to have this experience for his 60th birthday. And by the way, one of his guests, who they were all remarkable, a partner at um, Sequoia Capital who actually invested in Airbnb early and was like, I don't know what it is that you're doing here. I can't put my finger on what this is versus any other Airbnb or any other hotel, but this is remarkable. And I don't understand why like this isn't everywhere. I want this. Another person, three of them were partners at Goldman Sachs. Uh, they have family offices. They flew in private. And one of them booked for his 60th birthday, which is coming up. So we have a real hit rate of creating these experiences in locations that don't justify a hotel, um, putting brand new product purpose built. And so little things like we have outdoor lockers. So when they come in from the water, every single room has their own locker. You can put your own board and kite and wetsuit in there. Uh, we have outdoor showers that are hot. It's just like, we know who's coming. We know what they're doing there. We create this custom for them. It's not retrofit. Like I said, like the Joneses have a beach house and like I can go kiting from there. This is design, excuse me, this is designed for them. And they can't get it anywhere else. Okay, so, oh man, I, I don't usually get this excited, but I'm coming. <laughs> damn it! All right, so we're gonna we're gonna keep on this edge camp property for for a bit. Um, so part of your uh, this this what you just said is like I can't quite put my finger on what it is involves hiring all of these third party companies. And having them deliver at the level of hospitality that you expect. So let's just use some time to go. How do you find these people? How do you vet them out? How do you keep them all coordinated so that they're delivering consistently? Like, how do you create that that experience? Um, and if there's somebody listening that's you know trying to take something from it, like, what are the the core competencies here to make that all come together? Sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to take one minute and just tell you a little bit about how I found this idea because it goes back to I'm an investor, we find value, we create alpha, and so on. So I went down in 2017 um, to learn how to kiteboard. Um, a little bit of the backstory my ex wife uh, is an orthopedic surgeon. She's remarried uh, to another orthopedic surgeon, so you can connect the dots. And in 2017, she was having a, a wedding in New York City where I lived. And I just, we went to college together, so we had all similar friends and backgrounds. All these people were coming to her wedding. And I was like, look, let her have her moment in the light. She should enjoy this time. I'm just going to vacate. And I don't want like people to be like, hey, Richard, are you around on Sunday for you know like brunch? Let me just go do something that I've been meaning to do. Let her have her time. And so I wanted to go kiting. A lot of my skier friends said this is the second best sport behind skiing. So I was like, this is perfect time. I'm going to get out of here. Um, and I went down to uh, Real Water Sports, which is the preeminent place on Hatteras Island. I didn't know enough about it, but it turns out one of the best places in the world to go kiteboarding, one of the best places in the world to learn how to kiteboard. There's Real Water Sports, which put it on the map, and the largest international competitions are held on Hatteras Island, sponsored by like Red Bull and Patagonia. So like this is a real, you know, legitimate place. Went down there to learn how to kite, and um, my instructor, who's fabulous, Eric, said to me one day, Hey, Richard, um, I'm going to be a little bit late after lunch. I, I've got this Airbnb in like my garage and the same day turnover. And so I got to go clean it up and this and that. I'll see you in a little bit. I said, Eric, you Airbnb. Tell me about it. He's like, yeah, it's insane. I've got this little garage. 
I put a mattress in there. It doesn't even have heat. It's, you know, whatever it was. I don't recall the specifics. And I said, how's it doing? He's like, it's insane. I said, how often do you have same day turnover? Every single day. I said, tell me more. He said, I make more money from my Airbnb than being one of the head coaches here at Real Water Sports. Mm -hmm. I said, tell me more. <laughs> and so I, I said, you should go check out my YouTube channel. I teach people how to do this. And so like he did, we actually filmed some videos together, but that was sort of my like moment where, you know, I was there to learn how to kite. Now I'm looking at real estate. I went to go look at real estate. All of it was, you know, 20, 30 years old, really poor, uh, not necessarily the highest quality construction at the time, rode hard, put away wet, deferred maintenance. And I was just like, well, maybe I should build. So I started looking at land, right place, right time. Luck has a lot to do with this or manifesting your stuff or what, however you want to look at it. But I'm a big believer in, um, you know, I have a certain amount of skill and I have a very high risk tolerance. That's one of the things that I think uh, differentiates me from other people. Most people shy away from risk. I actually embrace risk, right? Like risk is my superpower. If you want to lay that risk off, I'll take it on for the right price. Right? We talked about that earlier, two-sided market. So I, I wanted to go look at all this land, right place, right time. Fast forward to today, uh, we're the second largest landowner on Hatteras Island. The first largest is the US government. 95% of the island is preserved in perpetuity as national seashore. So they're not making any more of it. And at this point, we have uh, north of 50 acres of future development for short-term rentals in one of the most desirable vacation rental markets on the planet. So um, we went big. We bought it at distressed prices. The reason we were able to buy it at distressed prices is, again, forward thinking macro view. It turns out that Hatteras Island is an island connected to the mainland. The bridge that was built, that connected the two, was built in 1963 by the US Army Corps of Engineers. It was guaranteed for 30 years. So in 1993, it was no longer maintained or deemed safe passage. And from 1993 until I got there in 2017, they were trying to figure out what do we do with the old bridge? How do we build a new bridge? How do we raise the money? Environmental concerns, right? This is national seashore. So when I got there, there was this half built new bridge. Everybody saw it. Everybody knew it. There was no surprises. The difference is what I thought it meant. So there are reasons that people sell real estate, death, divorce bankruptcy, kids go to college, lose a job. That's selling pressure. There's real reasons that people must sell. There's not a lot of reasons that people must buy, right? Especially on a barrier island that's hard to access. So consequently, more sellers than buyers. And for 20 years, you just look at a line, it went straight down. Most people look at that chart and say, that's a lot of risk. And I don't really like that. And I'm not buying it. I look at that and I'm like, Wait a minute. You're telling me I can buy land for 10 cents versus the 2005 high? I'll buy it all. And so that's literally for pennies on the dollar. We amassed 50 acres. Again, right place, right time, right introductions, right network, just presenting myself as somebody that you know people wanted to do business with and so on. Um, and so we put that all together. And the, the house that I just mentioned was our first purchase. We built, again, everyone thought I was crazy, really hard to get financing. Um, people said, you can't build this on the sound side. The ocean front is where people will spend money. We broke all sorts of records. We did more revenue in 2021 than any other house on Hatteras Island. It's the first time the sound traded for a premium to the ocean front. I continue this to believe that the sound, like we see in Turks and Caicos, because of kiteboarding, will trade to a premium over ocean front. People pay a lot of money to go to the ocean side and they sit there and they tan and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I have oceanfront too. Um, but where you get people uh, to pay a premium is when you're enabling their passion. You're giving them access that they wouldn't otherwise have. All of a sudden price sensitivity goes out the door. And so we broke all sorts of records. Uh, we have now three homes out of, we have up to 200 homes that we're able to build. Um, I'm not sure that we'll do it quite at that density. But that's just sort of the size and the scale of what we're doing at Edge Camp Sporting Club in the Outer Banks. We're also building an Edge Camp Sporting Club here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, an Edge Camp Sporting Club in Nosara, Costa Rica. We have a couple of other locations that we have uh, yet to put under contract and have not announced. But the concept is we're creating this outdoor and like, here's the way to think of it, Chris. You're familiar with the Patagonia brand? 
you know what they stand for, you know their quality, you know, like we all do, right? The future of short-term rentals, you asked how people can think about this going forward and monetize it. The future of short-term rentals is to niche down, provide for your niche something that they can't get anywhere else, do it better than anybody else, and get lifelong raving fans who give you five-star reviews and tell all their friends. So the way that we're doing it is, if you imagine Patagonia creating um, boutique hotels or short-term rentals, and they have the Patagonia hotel in like Argentina for fishing and this one for ice climbing and this one for skiing and this one, people would eat that up and they would stay only at Patagonia hotels if it spoke to their sport. That's what Edge Camp Sporting Club is. So we've got locations for each different type of sport, the best break, the best snow, the best location. And then we cross sell and cross promote. Oh, you like skiing, Chris? Have you ever tried kiting? You might like it. Um, you like hiding? Have you tried yoga? Have you tried surfing? Um, interspersed with that, we also have uh, a slightly different component, which we think is you know complementary. We believe in in work hard, play hard, party hard, all of that. So we also have an edge camp social club where we're building in uh, Southampton, uh, Palm Springs, Palm Beach, Florida, and so they're less sporting related, but they appeal to the same group, the same niche when they're not doing their sporting activities. So when you're when you're finding a location from the sporting aspect, you're saying I need a ski and snowboard location. I'm going to go find the best place in the world for that and then I'm going to bring that's what's driving you to some locations. And then on your social aspect is you know, where are great places for people to come and interact and socialize that that meets the demographic that you are going after? That's how you find location. Yes, except I'm going to add the secret sauce, Chris. Ready? Everybody listening. This is the secret sauce. And this is what like differentiates the way that I think versus every other short-term rental host. And I'm sharing it with all of you. It's a zoning play. Short-term rentals are highly regulated. So I want the best zoning to allow me to have a competitive advantage forever versus everybody else. So we start with zoning. We identify the best zoning, then we identify the best sports and the best locations. And that's what gives us an unfair advantage over other people that are going and buying a second vacation house, right? They're just looking at how many square feet and the comps and this and that, or even um, people that are looking at hotels. They're like, well, I need to have this size and scale and so on. And so what we start to do is say, which short-term rental zoning is the most valuable in the world? What keeps it that way? In fact, what makes it even more valuable in the future? Um, and like, we want to have a monopoly on those short-term rental zoning rights and locations. Okay, then we're just going to talk about that. We're going to go back to what I wanted to ask. The, a, a lot of the questions here are, you know, zoning, regulation, ordinance. How do you get comfortable that what was a short-term rental is all of a sudden going to be walked back and can't be? So what, how do you, I, what zoning matters? And then how do you get comfortable that I have this zoning forever? Yeah. So um, again, most people view this stuff as a risk. My lens is it's an opportunity, right? Like I'm not scared of doing the hard work and, and putting in the time and the energy and finding this stuff. And then it becomes like my protective moat. Um, so the first thing I share, and this is anybody who's growing their own short-term rental portfolio, or you want a vacation home, it doesn't really matter, but make sure that it's legal. And what I mean by that is many people make the mistake that say, well, it's not illegal, so therefore it is legal. Well, that's fine, but reality is if it's not regulated, it doesn't mean it's legal. It just means it's yet to be regulated. So find places where there is a short-term rental law put in place, understand that law, make sure you can adhere to it. And it's very localized, right? So like the law in one county doesn't have any application to another township or anything like that. So start with make sure it's legal. Two, I like the added security of a lodging tax, uh, an overnight tax, an Airbnb tax, whatever it is. Uh, like you, I, I live in Wyoming, a zero state tax state. So I'm not a huge fan of overpaying taxes. But in this particular case, taxation is our friend. And it's also a pass through. I don't actually pay it. The guest pays the tax. But the reason the tax is a second layer of be benefit, it's like a belt and suspender approach, is that 
the community is now partners with our business and the community is dependent on our tax revenues to improve the middle school and to pave the roads and all the other improvements. And so it's very politically incorrect for somebody, no matter how much they dislike short-term rentals, to say, well, now we have a, a deficit and we're not finishing the high school, right? So like no politician is really gonna stand up and say, unless they have a solution for the millions of dollars of taxation, um, they're not really gonna change. Doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it's an added layer of protection. As it relates to what it is that we do, <clears throat> Uh, we tend to invest in places that have uh, long histories of vacation rentals, the entire, like the Hatteras Island. There is no business that's not tourist and vacation uh, oriented. So there is no law that will come in the future. We might have to do things differently or pay more taxes, but there's zero chance that they're going to say we can't do short-term rentals. There's 3,000 homes on the island. 99.9% .9 of them are short-term rentals. So like, could it change? Yes, it could. Um, is it likely to change? No, it's not. Um, in the areas that we bought, there was an HOA, uh, which I'm very against. So any of you listening, you know, pay close attention. The HOA could supersede the local laws and they have other powers. So make sure uh, to avoid HOAs or if you have an HOA, um, you know, that you are legally allowed. Turns out in the state of North Carolina, the way that we got comfortable with it is uh, the in order for something to change in, at the HOA level, it must be unanimous. And so since we're a homeowner, we could block it. And it also must be to the benefit of everybody else. It can't be deleterious and majority. So we got comfortable with that. And then we took it one step further. As we got larger in the space, we bought the entire thing and we are our own HOA and we've written our HOA policies very specifically allowing short-term rentals, specifying it could be mixed group, it could be individuals, they don't have to be related, you can have this many people. So like we write our own rules. In areas where um, it's more challenging and we can't uh, write our own rules, we go upstream and we buy higher quality zoning. The Southampton play uh, at Stomp Capital is exactly that. We're buying a 62 key motel. We're renovating it. We're working with world-class designers and decorators. We're creating this short-term experience, this new culture, this new vibe. We're gonna charge massive premium versus what they're getting today. Um, but we're grandfathered in. This has been operating as a hotel motel for generations. And it's likely going to remain because in the Hamptons, and I don't know how familiar you are, but there's almost no hotels. Short-term rentals are illegal. I don't see anybody saying, you know what I'd really like in as my neighbor is a big commercial hotel development. So like, let's, so we, we've identified this asset starting with zoning. We're buying invaluable zoning only um, it's not priced properly. Mm. I never asked you, not, don't mean to break it up. What happened to the bridge it had, uh, the, on the island oh. did they finish the damn bridge <laughs> yes they they um they finished the bridge um they have deconstructed the old bridge and they've taken it apart in an intelligent fashion and put it out as like barrier reef to promote you know environmental and fish and so on and so forth uh the island has absolutely boomed now the beta all real estate has risen as you know the Fed has been pumping uh, money in and COVID and so on. So there's a certain beta component, and I would be remiss to say that that didn't play a factor. All real estate went up. We went up significantly more. Um, the land that I was buying uh, at 10 cents on the dollar, today's mark to market is somewhere between four to five X um, what we paid for it three years ago. Uh, we bought more land uh, last year it's up about 75%. And one of the things that I combine, and I'd be remiss if I didn't share this with you and others, it's not gonna come as a surprise when I say it to you, you'll be like, yeah, everybody knows that, except everybody hears that, they don't necessarily know that. Um, and you talk about how we find value looking forward. Everything that I do starts and ends with scarcity, zoning, mispriced assets. You get the combination of all of that, generally speaking, you win. So I invest heavily on islands like um, Hatteras, valleys like Jackson Hole. 99% of this is preserved in perpetuity as national forest. It will never be developed. Of the 1% that is developable, 99% of it is already developed. 
of the 99% that's already developed, something like 5% is short-term rental legal. People that are listening to this don't understand how much value they're listening to right now. Um, I get it. I've You've totally blown my mind like three times already on this deal. <laughs> I, It's fun to talk about STRs and how cool and everything, but when you just get rid of all the coolness and go, what are the nuts and bolts of what's happening here? I feel this to my core. Um, well, I, thank you. Our, our, it's, it's not a zoning play for us, but why I love Class B Industrial, and this isn't about me, this is about you, you can't rebuild this stuff. There is no right. land. The construction's too high. Cities don't want to see new, you know, shitty industrial buildings going up in the middle of their city. Um, for me, it's a scarcity play. It's what you said. It begins and ends with it. And so when you're here, when you're telling me that, it's just rattling my cage. That's the thing that people don't understand. In order to believe in short-term rentals as an asset class, whether it's an individual or an institution, you have to have the following belief system: one that it's here to stay. I think we can all agree that it's growing incredibly quickly. Brian Chesky's come out and said that today they need like 3 million more hosts to satisfy current demand. So like it's growing really quickly. He said something like 5 million people stayed in Airbnbs around the world on New Year's Eve. So it's definitely here. It's a public company. It's worth billions of dollars. I don't think that we're going to reverse course and people say like, I don't like that anymore. I only want hotels or I don't want to travel anymore. So it's here to stay. We, I think we can all agree on that. The other thing that's important on a forward looking basis is to say um, it's going to be more regulated and that's okay. Like now there's no rule that says I have to only invest like where I want. I, I invest in equity companies. I don't care where they're domiciled. They could be based in Austin. They could be based in Silicon Valley. They could be based in New York. Like your investment could be in a location where it's legal and cash flow positive and has opportunities. It doesn't have to be where you vacation if you're purely an investor, right? And then the third thing that we have to believe is that the zoning is mispriced. And let me give you an example. It's really easy. Right now, single family homes that are short-term rental legal trade at the exact same price as short as illegal short-term rentals. So it trades on the location and the comps and the number of square feet and et cetera. The fact that one of them throws off $200,000 worth of net operating income is carried at zero. The broker doesn't know it. The, the seller is embarrassed to say like they're Airbnb and making all this money. They think you want to buy it for your own home. So like nobody is talking about the business potential, the income potential. And yet every other real estate class out there, whether it's industrial, retail, commercial, the only thing that matters is the net operating income. In the single largest asset class, single family homes, you have businesses that are being operated out of these single family homes, generating hundreds of thousands, 20, 30, 40% cash on cash. And I'm not saying that that's like the norm, but there's people that are doing it. Um, and they're getting all of that zoning and that right for zero. They pay zero premium for that. All we have to believe is that in the future, net operating income potential for the short-term rental zoning will trade at a premium versus where it's illegal. And I'll give you an example. I always like to draw parallels to other things so that people don't think I'm just crazy. Um, in New York City, there's two types of apartments that you can buy. You can buy a condo. I think we're all familiar with what that is. You basically own your unit. Like I'm sitting in my condo in Jackson Hole right now. I physically own this. Um, in New York City, there's this antiquated thing. It's called a co-op. And you technically don't own your unit. You own shares in the cooperative. It's like you're a shareholder in, in the business. Now, you reside in your unit, and there's no question about that. But the difference is when you buy and sell a co-op, you have to put together a board package. And the co-op board package, and I don't know how they get away with this, but they do, they can reject your transaction, buying or selling, for any reason or no reason at all, including like racial discrimination, profiling, like it doesn't matter. They just, they want to know who's in their building. That added layer of like complexity, that added layer of less freedom means that condos trade at about, and it changes, you know, there's a range, maybe it goes from seven to 12%, but condos, because nobody can tell you, I can't sell to this or I can't buy it, trade at a seven to 12% premium over the slightly more restrictive co-op, right? So we see similar units with slightly different um, 
abilities to monetize and exit and freedom, people pay a premium for, I don't want anybody messing with me. I think in the future, we will see short-term rental legal zoning trade at a premium to short-term rental illegal zoning. What you're doing, and, and we don't have to spend much time on this at all, but what you're doing, I totally get. But to the maybe re-asking the question to a lot of the folks that maybe just own a, a short-term rental in a regular neighborhood in you know Regularville, United States, what what should they think about as far as you know ordinances changing and you know what once was your two hundred thousand dollar NOI? Sorry, it's gone. Uh, you know, some city council member decided they don't like that now. Is there? Do you have a different yeah. answer for that? And, you, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But that's no. It, when, when I've thought about that question, that's where I kind of freak out. Yeah. Look, if you're just going to go buy one or three vacation homes and put them on short term rentals, whether it's Airbnb or Verbo or Ultimately, what I would like to see you do is move to direct booking so that you're not like dependent on a platform. But if you're going to go do that, start with what I said. Make sure it's legal, right? Like not, well, there's no law saying it's illegal. Make sure it's legal. Look for places where it's taxed. That gives you a little bit more safety and security. And make sure that it has like a long operating history. So these tend to be more like vacation places. I don't know that short-term rentals have a place in like a dense urban area like New York City. It probably doesn't, and it may not ever be legal there, and I'm not advocating that it should be. There's plenty of hotels and other spaces, but here's the difference, and this is like what's unique to short-term rentals that many people miss. Those same hotels that operate well and provide beds and lodging in major urban areas like New York City, they're not going to go build on Hatteras Island. It's seasonal, there's hurricanes, there's not enough occupancy for the entire year. It's a totally different business model, which creates this gap. The consumer wants it. No one else is going to build it. And so there's an opportunity for a developer like myself or an institutional capital provider to come in and custom build, purpose build this new asset class. All right. Now I want to go back to the Hamptons for a second. Yeah. Mispriced zoning. How did that deal come to be? How did you find that deal? Like, I'm I'm assuming now, now I'm starting to get a really good understanding of how you're thinking. You've picked out several cities in the world that probably matter. You probably have your eye on certain parts of town that matter. And if something's going to pop up, you're getting an alert. But how did everybody else look at that motel? Were, were, did, were you just given an early look and it never came to market? Or did it sit on the market for a while Nobody liked it at the price. And you said, well, I feel like at that price, I'm still buying it for 20 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say, and this is helpful, whether you're buying a vacation rental or you're doing you know, more institutional type investing like I'm doing in the short term rental market is um, you have to know who you're attracting. Right. So like there's plenty of invaluable zoning that I would love to own. But if it's for, you know, I'm making this up for ballerinas. Um, it doesn't appeal to me. I don't know a lot about that. And so like, it could be valuable zoning, but I'm going to focus on the things that appeal to me. I always suggest that people get started in the short-term rental space, build it for yourself because what you know and what you like, chances are there are other people that like that too. So even though it seems like a risk, like, well, how do I know other people are going to like this place? Dude, if it appeals to you and it lights you up and you want to be there, then all we have to do is find more people that are like you. And there are plenty of other of those other people. So for me, I've uh, lived in New York City, as I mentioned. I've had homes in, in the Hamptons. I've had difficulty finding places to stay. It's a very expensive market to own. Um, and there's not a lot of lodging. And it's 100% sold out because there's, you know, New York City MSA is 90 minutes away. And everybody goes there pretty much every single weekend to like escape Manhattan. So I know what people are doing there. It appeals to me personally. I've had my eye in the area. Um, and to answer your question about like, how long was it on the market? I think it was on the market for a while. You had traditional, you know, hotel companies say it's not big enough, uh, or it's not scalable enough, or it's a motel and it's not on brand or anything like that. But a significant portion of what we do and opportunities that I see going forward and that we're monetizing in Stomp is redevelopment plays. So we're going out and we're buying existing assets, not single family homes and renovating them. We don't really do that. But we'll go out and buy these boutique hotels, 
bed and breakfasts, motels, things that have grandfathered zoning that is mispriced. And there's not a lot of people that are looking for bed and breakfasts. You know, like that was a generation ago. People were like, oh, I'm going to retire and I'll make some eggs in the morning and people will stay with me. And like with Airbnb, nobody wants to do that anymore. And so consequently, people are like, uh, I want to sell. I really want to retire and there's no buyers. And so we come in and we buy these assets uh, mispriced. We're you know, providing liquidity because there's not a lot of people that are buying these things. I'm buying assets that have sat on the market for a year or longer at huge discounts. We redevelop them, make them on brand, turn them into short-term rentals. And Chris, you're not going to believe this. We charge higher rates and provide less service and make more profit. Nobody wants to go sit with like somebody and listen to, about their kids and stuff. I don't mean to be you know disrespectful, but like, do you? <laughs> I wouldn't have believed you before we started, but we're an hour in, and I'm I you have me so kind of in the zone right now, which brings me to the next question. When I do think of buying sixty two units or or owning a four you know several units, you know, management. How are you managing these things? Um, do you do it internally? Do you hire a third party company? How do these things get premium level management service? Absolutely. And and look, I think the execution risk in all of this is probably the largest risk that we or any entrant faces, right? Um, the good news is it's not a full service hotel, nor do we try to be, right? What people are actually seeking, um, and this is what I call modern hospitality. So traditional hospitality is you have something that's very luxurious. You have a lot of staff. You train them really well. They know how to say, yes, sir, and Mr. Uh, Powers, and let me open the door for you and all that stuff. Like that's kind of uh, traditional hospitality. And by the way, that never goes away. And there's a time and a place for it. And I love it myself personally, um, sometimes. But there's other times, the vast majority of times, where I just want to go to this location that's remarkable with incredible views and water access and I want to be left alone. I don't want the garage attendant, the elevator man, the bell man. I don't need like my luggage delivered to me. I just want it to work. So modern hospitality, and this is what I teach again on the YouTube channel and so on, is forward thinking. So what do I mean by that? I want Chris and his family to walk into my homes. They've never been there before, but it feels familiar and it all works. You know where the lights are. You know how to get the TV working, the air conditioning. Like It's all forward thinking and intuitive. We know that total strangers, having never been there before, are going to be coming in all the time for years. And so we forward design that user experience so that it just works. So consequently, we have much less need on labor to rectify, solve, train, educate because of the design that we've enabled. To answer your question very specifically, and this is where people are missing why this can be an institutional asset class, we have a, a centralized middle and back office that does all of the revenue management, that does all of the guest communications, that sends all the instructions and check-in and so on, handles all of the cleaning schedules, and all of that is centralized. And so we do that for all of our locations out of one central office, and we can scale that rather easily. I think everybody understands that. Um, on location, on premise, we have a very small group and it depends on the size of the location, but it could be as little as one general manager that owns that location. And around that general manager, we've developed pre-vetted um, relationships with plumbers, HVAC, and so on. So they're on call, they're on demand, they know who we are. One of the questions you asked earlier was like, how do you leave, keep that level of service up? Um, we generally try to be the best employer and the best relationship in that location for that vendor. So we try and send them more business, pay more quickly, treat them with respect, tell them what it is that we're growing. And our innovative business model draws and attracts them too. So it's really scalable around the central core of middle and back office centralized and then hub and spoke like in each location one general manager, one general manager, one general manager. Obviously, as the locations in the outer banks grow, we'll develop an entire property management team. But right now, we're able to do it like that. On, on, uh, are you, if somebody was kind of getting started, um, are you hiring like a third party consultant to help you think through these workflows and how the, the properties are designed so that they just work? Or is this just something you have to learn from, from being in it? How how are you kind of getting these to perfection? 
Um, so we don't we don't work with uh, any third party consultants on um, on any of that. Uh, we're sort of I, I I think we're kind of writing the rules. Uh, we're not there's no there's nobody to copy. Uh, there's nobody to say like that works really well. But I would say for people that are interested in getting started and doing this, uh, I've spent my entire life traveling the world. I've stayed in so many incredible hotels and bed and breakfast and, you know, literally for my prior job as a global hedge fund manager uh, for the last few years researching short term rentals. I actively travel and I borrow, steal whatever the best of and I remove uh, the things that don't work. And so we're creating our own playbook. And for those of you that are you know, interested in getting started, go stay at half a dozen Airbnbs and half a do dozen different locations before you just like light up your own and say like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like do research and development. <laughs> yep. And it's fun research and development, right? Like, oh, sorry, you're going to have to go on a little vacation. Yep. Okay. On, on kind of to, to, to bring the, the management kind of topic uh, full circle. Um, how are people finding and booking you? We'll, we'll, we'll focus you. I know there's Airbnb where people book. And this got brought up on Twitter the other day, and I just thought you had a really good answer to it. Is, uh, you know, if you're using Airbnb or VRBO or some of these third parties to find your property and they know what your margin is, then it's very easy for them to go, well, guess what? It costs double to book through Airbnb now. How do you think about kind of how you're, how are people booking you? And then do you see any risk in these third parties eating into your margin? Yeah. So um, the first thing I would say is I think being on platforms is inherently risky. So consequently, I encourage everybody and I teach people to be on multiple platforms. You don't want to be all on Airbnb and then be deplatformed or have a dispute or something like that. Your entire business is now at Jeopardy. So always list on Airbnb and Verbo um, at a minimum. Um, as far as eating into our margins, the reality of it is it's an incredible deal. Uh, right now, you're able to attract consumers and clients and guests that want your exact experience for like zero marketing cost. And if you were going to try and replicate this your own, whether it's through social media or through ads or whatever, uh, your cost would be far higher than what the platforms charge, which to me tells me that the platform pricing is going to increase going forward, not decrease. Um, so get ready for that. Here's the answer, Chris. And, you know, I'm being as direct and as honest as I possibly can be, but yet it's not going to sound really credible. If you're doing unique enough, I was going to say a, a curse word, unique, you can unique curse. stuff. All right. If you're doing unique shit, and people are searching for it, they're going to find you. And so by way of example, our Edge Camp Sporting Club, um, we just did the analysis for 2021, 52% of our bookings came direct, meaning through our website. This is year one, by the way, in business, right? Zero reviews, turn the lights on, 52% of our bookings, and we did uh, about $700,000 worth of revenue year one in this one location. Uh, which again, beat all the records on the island. We're now speaking to local lenders who turned us down, thought we were crazy. They're like, hey, we can't believe what you're doing. We can't believe your margins. Uh, we'd like to have a relationship with you. So they're coming to us too. So if you do unique enough shit, and it turns out that there's like real demand for it, um, people find you. 52% of our bookings came direct. 40% came from Verbo. Verbo tends to do really well in vacation rental markets. It's been operating for a longer period of time. And like 7% came from Airbnb. I'd love for that to grow. I don't have anything against Airbnb. I'm very grateful for Airbnb. I got IPO shares from Brian Chesky, you know, at, at cost. Um, so I'm a huge fan and advocate of Airbnb. But I also realize they have a lot of power, both in terms of pricing and display and algorithm. And I would encourage entrepreneurs uh, to try and own the relationships. And the, what I like in it too in e-commerce is like, yeah, you can do a ton of business on Amazon and, and you should, but you should also have your own Shopify store so that you get Chris's email and you can tell him about specials and you can cross sell and cross promote and market and so on. So you want to try and develop that local brand, that local presence that people can then share with their friends and loved ones who want to book. Um, and that's what keeps you, you know, sustainable, repeatable and building a book of business that has value, those relationships. All right. 
I want to go back to a, a spot where we were chatting and, and you've hit on this a lot of different times. Um, but I think the more I'm learning about what you're doing, it, it is um, really critical. You talked about the gentleman that spent like 40 or 50 grand to rent, but then spent 150 grand on everything else. The, uh, the everything else piece. So when you're looking at a market and obviously like a Jackson Hole, very touristy, they're going to have lots of stuff to do, lots of resources around there. Um, what matters to you in a market and like, how are you thinking of what experiences to offer or is the customer coming and saying, Hey, we're going to be there. And we've been to Jackson Hole before and we like all this stuff. Please book it all for us. Yeah. So, um, we start and then they augment. So what I mean by that is again, since we have a very clear understanding of who's coming and I say this time and time again, and people still don't get it. Like, it's generally you. You're building this for yourself. You know what you like. So when we go to these locations, we know what activities we like to do. We know what activities we wish we could do. And those are the uh, things that we enable and the relationships that we build. So in the Outer Banks, we've got massage, in-house yoga, chefs, an oyster shucking experience. We have relationships with the local brewer uh, that can come and talk about the different brew, you know, brews. I don't drink, so the brews that they uh, that they have. We have uh, kiting instruction. We have gear rental, whether it's uh, stand up paddle boards, kayaks, bicycles. Um, we have beach dinners, catered beach dinners. We have live music, and then we'll speak to the people. Uh, as I mentioned, my girlfriend Erica is the director of hospitality, and she starts with a phone call. Chris, when you and your family come down, I know you haven't been together. It's COVID. It's challenging. What does success look like? Like, tell me what you would like to do, and then we'll enable that. And so through that, we've had experiences where people say, you know, my um, my husband really likes fire dancing. And so we've literally <laughs> flown in fire dancers from California to Hatteras Island to perform. Now, I'm not saying that's an everyday occurrence, but for this individual, money wasn't the thing that they were optimizing for. It was that experience that would light the guy up. So we flew in fire dancers. And, and can I just say one thing, Chris? You can so say whatever you want. That, that, that strategy, by the way, is I, where I think the future of short-term rentals go. I call that STR 3.0. And that's where you're no longer selling like just the lodging. Right now we're selling, I've got four bedrooms. You got a, you know, a view of the lake. It's 200 yards to this. That's where we are today. But I think in the future, as more and more people learn and embrace this, and literally I've helped dozens, if not hundreds of people quit W-2 jobs where they were dissatisfied, become professional real estate investors in this space. As more and more people spend more and more time and energy in this location and learn like what's working, you're going to start to see more of these experiences activated by more hosts. And that becomes the competitive mode. So like if you're only selling lodging, you're could be good, but your profit margins are going to go down. If you're now enabling an experience for a day, a week, a month, um, it's incredibly successful. And where we're taking it, because we're doing things, again, at a larger scale and more institutional, we've had incredible success and demand from corporate offsites. We had um, 65 people come do an entire buyout of all of our properties. They would have bought more properties, except they're still under construction. But it was the creative um, and design teams from uh, a technology groups that we've all heard of, Adobe, Airbnb, Uber, Google, and they go once a year offsite. The year prior, it was the North Shore of Hawaii. Um, they rented all of our homes and we enabled all of the uh, chefs and servers and everything else that they needed. And it was absolutely remarkable. Um, and there's not a lot of places. It's a very different experience if you think about it. We're all huge fans of Reconvene. I met you there. I'm going to see you there again next year. Um, it's a wonderful experience, but it's a very different experience when we're all meeting in like the lobby versus if we all had at our current house at Edge Camp, the top floor is 4,000 square feet of just open space, floor to glass windows. You just see nothing but water and you're all commingling in like this large purpose built home the depth of the relationships that you build is much greater than if you were co-mingling and walking by strangers and using hush tones because you're in a common elevator so this corporate uh, retreat concept i think is huge going forward all right i'm just assuming um 
that you're structuring these deals basically like anybody would structure a real estate deal. You're buying land, you're building property, it's got rent, it's got expenses, it's got a return. Um, fair enough to say? There's nothing unique? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I, I think the only thing that we would say is we try and 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 buy right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that's where a lot of the money is made. But if you were to and 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 if you were to get that magical offer, are people valuing this stuff, or maybe it's too early on a cap rate basis? Is it? Are you selling an operating company and a piece of real estate? Like, do you even know how you're valued right now? Um. So right now we're valued as a real estate company, uh, and and the real estate by and large is valued uh, based on comps, at least in the outer banks. Uh, the the Southampton property does trade at a, a, a cap rate because it's more of like in the hospitality comp set, but that's improper because the amount of uh, NOI that we'll generate is different uh, than what a traditional hospitality company will do. So in the future, I believe we will trade at a cap rate, and I believe that cap rate will be um, much tighter than it is today. Uh, and a lot of that is based on I think the scarcity, the zoning, the people that we have locked up, and in the future, I believe our operating company has tremendous value as well. Yep. Are you building your own tech, or do you use off-the-shelf stuff and just kind of build it or stack it how it works for you? So that's what's really uh, amazing. It's the latter. Uh, we do have in-house developers, so like all these crazy things that I dream of and reports and connect this and zap it over here. Like we do that too, but the, the basis of what we run our business on, and this is yet another data point as to why I have such conviction that this becomes an institutional asset class is the ecosystem in and around short-term rentals, SaaS companies, different layers, different tech that's being added is growing and growing really quickly. And as I shared with you earlier, I always like to take a look at like what's happened in other industries so that we can you know at least connect the dots. If you take a look at Salesforce, that was one of the earlier CRM providers, there's literally billions of dollars of ecosystem around that one platform. There's no reason that short-term rentals and Airbnb's ecosystem shouldn't be way larger than that, right? Because like not everybody needs a CRM, but many people need lodging, hospitality, vacations, working space, remote working. So the TAM is much bigger than CRM, and yet Salesforce does billion, tens of billions of dollars ecosystem layered on top of it. When I think of these properties, and again, we've been talking about long-term leases and some of the, the locations that you've described, Jackson Hole, um, those seem to be seasonal uh, businesses. So I'm imagining there's parts of the year where uh, you're probably not collecting as much. So how do you think about these cash flow streams as far as like annually and not, and not so choppy? Yeah, so that that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons that say um, cap rates might be wider in certain hospitality segments. But going back to my investor days and portfolio construction, which is a huge benefit, I can't underscore how important it is to have a portfolio construction. So Stomp Capital is a fund. We don't raise money deal by deal. If you invest in Stomp, you have access to all of our deals. And part of that benefit is this portfolio construction. It allows us to diversify risk. And we think about risk very differently than others. So we have hurricane risk. So we add wildfire. We have wildfire risk. So we add earthquake. By adding all of these different risks into the portfolio, we're actually reducing the overall level of the portfolio risk and sizing it appropriately. Mm. We do similar with the cash flow. We add locations, not only for their unique zoning and their unique sports and their unique locations and assets, but also for their cash flow characteristics. So if you think about it, we can synthetically replicate the certainty of your 12-month lease. All we need to do is find a place that fires on all cylinders January, February, March, April, et cetera. And now we have the exact same cash flow characteristics, low volatility, certainty at the portfolio level that you have via a 12-month lease, only we're two or three X higher in terms of yield. And and maybe one just question, what do you do in the off season? Do they sit vacant? Do you just rent them for very, like, what do you think for those six months where there's literally not a lot of activity? 
So it really depends on the individual, right? So like if you if you need to rent the the place for the mortgage payment and you don't have a whole portfolio and you don't have that dampened uh, volatility that I just discussed, you might want to just rent it for you know cost or even just below cost to get in the the income. What we actually do is we don't discount. Uh, we generally aren't. Uh, price sensitive, and consequently, we don't want the wear and tear. We don't want the wrong guest in there. We're seeking to have really great properties for the right guest who can afford it. We do have seasonal pricing, so it's much less in January than in August, for yeah. instance, but we don't really discount it much below that. And yet what we find, as I just shared with you earlier on the podcast, there's people who say, hey, I want to take it for February and March and work remotely. So we're not seeing um, challenges with places sitting empty and vacant unless we're you know turning people down we say no all the time we don't yeah. just let anybody who can pay come and rent our place um but it's important for people to understand their own financial parameters where we sit from a financial perspective we would choose vacancy versus the wrong guest who could destroy it or you know damage it and then it's not perfect for the right guest yep all right man <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember sitting at uh, reconvene night two and you're over in the corner closing on like two or three deals. Um, my only regret now from reconvene is that I didn't go uh, spend more time with you there. Uh, this is this has been just awesome. You your ability to communicate and, and, and get this message out is um, is world class. But I really do want to come stay at one of your properties. You have to, and it would be my to. honor, and 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 you should be, um, you should be looking at the space, and it's kind of interesting because so many people kind of dismiss the short-term rental space because it's not scalable and it's got regulatory risk, and I don't know how to do it, and it's got a lot of operations, and like that's the opportunity. The more people that don't think they can do it, the more we can go and land grab stuff in the interim before it becomes the reality. But if you just break it down into simple things, like they're all achievable. You just have to want to and figure it out and problem solve, which is what makes us entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, it's very similar to what it is that you're doing. As we discussed in industrial, you're getting zoning and proximity and you're making a forward bet on e-commerce and deliverability and same day. Like, I get what it is that you do. I don't know how to do it. I definitely don't want to compete with you. You know, like I'm a better LP to you than I am, um, you know, trying to compete with you. But that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be looking at the short-term rental space either as active investors and doing it themselves or passive investors. But this opportunity set is um, one of the best I've ever seen in my entire professional investment career. The fact that I can buy on comps and exit at a cap, at a cap rate, and the fact that I'm generating all this alpha, um, the ability to sort of like predict what people are wanting to do in the future and then enabling that, like making that a reality, um, is extremely rewarding. And, you know, we're delighting the most influential people on the planet with things that they've never done before. And that's really rewarding for myself and my team. And it keeps us going. And you get to travel around the world and stay in your own places and have a lot of fun doing it. It's look, um, I, I sent a tweet around earlier and, and I mean it, you know, there's a lot more people that are far more wealthy and successful than I am. And I just hope they're as happy as I am. I've, I've decided that for me, um, quality of life every single day is really important. Like what it is that I see, what it is that I do, what activity, where I am. And so for me, I actually literally change seasonally, right? Like some people stay in New York and there's four different seasons. I adjust for every season to do the sport and activity that I want to do it in the best place for that sport and activity. And then I built a business around that. How um how can people find you uh, both professionally on on on, on online? Um, if folks are interested in investing in this space, how, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah. So let me um, say the following. Twitter has been remarkable. I'm so glad I met you and everyone else there. So follow me on Twitter. I'm Richard Fertig. Uh, if you want to learn more about the short-term rental space and you want to do it yourself, that's called Short-Term Rental University. We have 63,000 subscribers on YouTube. There's over 500 videos. I give everybody all of, you know, like my special sauce and secrets. And I just want you to succeed, right? Like I spent the first part of my life keeping the super wealthy institutions, endowments, pension funds, insurance companies, like the most successful institutions on the planet. I kept them wealthy. Um, 
Short-Term Rental University, the YouTube channel, I would have been fired if I made a video, if I spoke to the press, if I gave away any secrets. This was sort of like that rebellion, like I want to give to everybody now. So I put it all out there, 500 videos on Short-Term Rental University. We also have uh, 51,000 uh, Facebook members in the same group, Short-Term Rental University. 51,000 global hosts around the planet asking questions. Hey, this happened. How would you respond? Hey, what would you do in this instance? I need help with mattresses. What are you guys buying? Incredible resource. So join that as well. Uh, and if you want it done for you, meaning like you like what you heard, you think the asset class has legs, you believe in my uh, abilities and outlook and so on, you want to co-invest and you want it done for you, I've created Stomp Capital um, and that's where we, I'm the general partner. I'm also the single largest investor in every one of my deals. So I'm doing this for myself and my family office and my, you know, my estate. Uh, and I'm inviting people to co-invest. The reason I'm doing that and people ask me is the opportunity is bigger than I am personally and size matters. And when we go dangle something really shiny and exciting to these institutional players, it has to have meaningful opportunity to their bottom line. It doesn't matter how great my ideas are. If it doesn't move the needle, they're not going to buy it. So the opportunity is bigger than I am. Through crowdfunding, we can get more of these incredible assets, locations, and zoning. And I think it becomes even more attractive uh, to a larger, broader audience, whether it's Blackstone or KKR or Starwood or all these other companies that we've never heard of. But there's not many people doing what it is that we're doing yet. And so we have a, a head start, and I'm excited to take advantage of that head start. So stomp capital. Stomp capital, baby. Stomp, stomp. Oh, and let me just share this. I've never shared this with anybody before. I can't believe nobody's ever asked me, but this is a great time. Uh, people should know why stomp capital, because it's kind of a weird name. Uh, and it comes from uh, skiing here. So I'm out here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You probably have heard of Corbett's Calore, which is one of the most extreme uh, ski drop-ins of any area. And so people are so good here that they do all these aerial tricks and they do double backflips and 720s and insane stuff entering into the hardest place to access. And when they, when they land properly, they stomp the landing. So it's all, it doesn't matter what you're doing in the air, it's all about the landing. And so for me, stomp capital, we're, stop, we're stomping the landing. I don't care about all the fancy acrobatics and all the naysayers and all this other stuff that's happening that may distract. We're stomping the landing. I love it. Richard, this was uh, this was just great. It really was uh, a treat. Um, you certainly opened my mind quite a bit. I, I was not expecting this in the least. Not not in a bad way. <laughs> right. But man, uh, this was this was powerful stuff today. Thank you. Well, Chris, um, I respect and admire not only what you've done at Fort, but also on the podcast as a fellow content creator, kudos on both uh, success. And, you know, I love the fact that we've now got uh, uh, more to talk about and oh, yeah, a growing relationship. And I'm certain that the best is yet to come.